Great. Well, a very, very warm welcome again to the second day of the seminar series here in Base Camp in the Packing Hall. And yesterday, of course, we were challenged from uh, China. And today we're moving to North Africa. And uh, Claire Heath White will be opening up the, the lens on history of a very significant woman gone out from this place uh, in the past. And of course, as yesterday, we ask ourselves the question, based on history, what does that mean for us today? How do we take that challenge of the past and impact our future ministry going forward? So let's just pray for a moment and then Claire will take us through this seminar. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of gathering today freely in this place the opportunity, Lord, that we have to gather is not something we want to take for granted. Thank you for those that have gone before us, thousands upon thousands of missionaries that have gone across the world to take your gospel hope, your gospel love, your gospel message to all manner of nations. Lord, help us to be able to learn from those lessons and to apply that into our daily lives right where we are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, it's a bit hotter today, so hopefully you'll still be able to concentrate and hope you've all got water or something to keep you going. Um, so welcome to those, uh, to those to whom this is the first uh, morning in here. Um, just to, for, for them particularly, and also a recap for those of you who've had so much input over the last 24 hours, you've forgotten what this is all about. This seminar stream is called Grateful for Their Witness, and we're looking at four uh, missionaries who went to different parts of the world, but all of whom were influenced or influenced mission uh, interest at the Keswick Convention. So they either were called directly from the convention, were supported by the convention, or had influence on the convention. And yesterday, we saw Hudson Taylor, who's the in his old age, shown in the picture up here, in his Chinese dress. Um, China, Hudson Taylor, uh, who obviously went to China, and he was very influential in the Keswick Convention. He was one of the ones who really pushed for the Ke uh, Keswick Convention to be more focused on mission. And as I said yesterday, he called it his happy hunting ground for missionaries. He knew that if he came to the convention, where people were sitting under God's word, that they would be wholeheartedly committed to him, and many would want to serve him overseas. And the challenge is, well, what about us? Are we that wholehearted? Do we take God at his word and want to serve him with all of our hearts, whatever that might look like? Now, the other pictures um, we've got today, we're looking at Lilia Trotter, the lady in the middle. And I guess for many of you, much less well-known than Hudson Taylor. So hopefully this will be eye-opening to you. And then down here, this distinguished-looking gentleman, he's Barclay Buxton, who we'll be looking at on Thursday, the Keswick Lecture tomorrow, so we come back on Thursday. And then finally, perhaps for Keswick, the most well-known Keswick missionary, Amy Carmichael, up the top there. Uh, so today, we're going to be looking at uh, Lilius Trotter. I can't remember. I've got a clicker today. There we go. Lilius Trotter. Um, she was 20 years or so younger than Hudson Taylor, so another generation, um, and died 1928, again, just that bit later. And today, the focus is going to be on her mission to Algeria in North Africa, which is where she went. And every day, we're taking a different theme from these people's lives. It's too much to cover every aspect of their lives in just under an hour. So we're going to look at, at her ambition and her agenda and be thinking about our ambitions and how far they're in line what the Lord wants and how far we allow our ambitions to be dictated by the world and same with our agenda. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So, as we did yesterday, we're going to start off with a bit of a challenge for each one of us. Here's a Bible verse from 1 Chronicles. Uh, Riches and honour come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Everything we have comes from you, and we give you only what you have already given us. And so just 
turn to your neighbour. Again, if you would rather just think about these things on your own, that's fine. But sometimes it is helpful just to chat, to kind of focus our thoughts and be prompted by others. What riches and honours do you have? You might look at yourself, I don't have anything. I'm just an ordinary person. But what gifts, what talents, what privileges, what background? It might just be I've had a stable home. Or it might be I've got a really good sense of humour. There are lots of things. And if you say you haven't got any, actually that's a bit disrespectful to God. He's made you with gifts and talents and privileges and backgrounds. And then how does the fact that these are all from God, how does that change the way you view um, and use what you have? Okay, so first of all, think. Don't be modest. Think about what gifts, talents, privileges, background God has given you. And how does the fact that God has given those to you help? It might be you have actually had a difficult background, and actually God can use that too. So just spend a couple of minutes, two or three minutes, to discuss that. Right, you all, you all have lots of gifts, talents, and privileges to share. There's a wonderful burble as everybody was chatting. That's fantastic. Um, now, the girl we're going to be looking at, to, well, the woman we're going to be looking at today, um, was a girl with potential. I went slightly mad. I don't know if you noticed yesterday, it was all C's. I love doing this, I'm into alliteration. So there's lots of P's. Um, I don't know if that helps if you're writing notes, but I always, it helps me think. Um, so, Lilius Trotter, um, she was born into privilege. She was the seventh of nine children, which in that time was not actually that exceptional, obviously very large families, but she was the oldest of her father's second wife's children. So there were two mums, um, first wife died and then uh, remarried Lilius's mum. And so she took that responsibility seriously as being the oldest of the three younger children. Um, it was the kind of family that expected their children to succeed. Now, most of her siblings have got Wikipedia entries, and none of them mention her. So it's not that, oh, this was the sister of Lilla Estrosa. She's not mentioned anywhere. So they all had fairly key roles in business, or in the church, or in um, the empire. So they were pretty... Um, exceptional family, and they expected their children to be exceptional and to, you know, to really flourish and to, be, to succeed. Um, the father was definitely a, a committed Christian, and these were the days in the kind of middle of the 19th century when most wealthy Christians really did have a social conscience. If you think of Lord Shaftesbury and factory reform and stopping kids going up chimneys, all that kind of thing. There was so much to be done to make Britain a better place. And a lot of wealthy Christians were really at the forefront of that kind of thing in helping improve the country. So he was involved in the setting up of the YMCA as a hostel uh, for people to be able to stay to keep them safe. Um, he was involved in prison reform, um, in schools work, in um, mental uh, asylums, as they were called then, to improve conditions there. Um, so he was a rich man, but he did have a social conscience and a very deep faith. Um, Lilius was educated by a governess, again, as was normal for a young girl at the time. And even as a very young child, she was a very gifted artist. Her parents went on a trip to America when she was about five, and they gave her a sketchbook so she could draw things for them when, she ke when they came back and show them what she'd, uh, she'd been up to. And they're exceptional for a five-year-old. Um, you know, normally if you have to pin your five-year-old's picture to the fridge, it's usually you're a proud parent, but others would probably not be quite so complimentary. She really was exceptional um, from a very young age. She was quite a serious-minded kid. Um, and like I said, she took a responsibility of being big sister quite seriously, but she always loved traveling. She always had, so she loved going on holiday in the UK, and as she got older, she always had a passion for going to new places. But then um, pain in the, t in the sense that her father died, her much-loved father died when she was 12. And um, it was a real tragedy. She loved her father very dearly, um, and they had to move. And they did downsize, but they were that wealthy that downsizing didn't mean a lot. So they moved to Montague Place in London, 
Um, Anthony Trollope, the famous author of the Barchester Chronicles, lived next door. Um, recently, um, flat three of their house sold for 2.2 million. Okay, that was just the flat. They had the whole thing. Interesting but totally irrelevant flat, uh, the fact that Jimi Hendrix lived there in the 60s. It was a bit more bohemian then, as did Ringo Starr. So there you go. But not when they lived there then. It was, it was quite a, um, a wealthy area, um, but not, you know, not quite what she was used to. And she almost became her mother's companion um, during those years, in her, um, from 12 onwards. So quite a hard thing to do, to support her grieving mum and look after the two younger ones. And, but with her mother, she enjoyed travelling. And one of the places they travelled to was Venice. And while they were there, they were staying in the hotel with a man called John Ruskin. Now, this is John Ruskin, uh, painted, I think, by Millet. Ruskin was, at the time, one of the most famous men of his generation. He was an art critic. And it's reckoned that he pretty much single-handedly launched the careers of the Pre-Raphaelites, if you know them, who now are incredibly popular and famous. Um, what he said in the art world went. Very famous and in influential man in the same hotel. So here was Lilius, who was still sketching away, and her very proud mummy. And so in a typical embarrassing mother mode, um, <laughs> Mrs. Potter went up to John Ruskin and said, oh, you might like to see my daughter's sketches. And you know, here we go again. And um, he looked and he thought, wow, actually, she really is very good. Um, and he invited her to go sketching with him around Venice. I said, she seemed to learn everything the instant she was shown it, and ever so much more than she was taught. She always had a natural talent. I mean, Victorian girls sketched, you know, that's the kind of thing that middle class girls did. They did embroidery sewing pianos so that they could get married to a rich man who could enjoy her sketching piano and embroidery. But she was obviously particularly gifted at it. Um, and later he said this, he said, she would be the greatest living painter and do things which would be immortal. So she's not just a gifted girl who could have a career as a kind of maybe an illustrator of children's books or something like that. He said she could be the greatest living painter. And saying that, other people would have listened and have considered her the greatest living painter. So fame and fortune beckoned. He was offering her prestige in a world when perhaps now there's artists, you've only heard of the odd few and they're all a bit weird, aren't they? So, but in those days, uh, you know, to be an artist, a famous artist, that offered you a real status in society. Plenty, she'd have been very wealthy. If Ruskin said her paintings were worth having, she would have been a wealthy woman. I mean, she was already a wealthy woman. She would have been popular. She'd been fated by the who's who of London society. She was offered immortality. Her name would go down in history said, everybody's heard of Hudson Taylor, interestingly. Very few of you, I think, have probably heard of Lilia Strotter before today. And something, I think, which is a bit more challenging, her potential would have been fulfilled. You know, she's got this gift. Well, you need to fulfill those gifts, don't you? And do what it takes to fulfill the potential uh, that God has given you. So she became um, almost his protege. And he had a place, um, Brantwood, up in the beautiful Lake District, great place to paint, um, and she came and stayed. And they developed a really deep bond. Slightly weird, actually. He was, you know, a bit kind of needy and a bit odd towards her. But she had that experience of staying in a home and mixing with the artistic elite, having those conversations and having her paintings criticised and um, applauded when she stayed with him and the friendship of one of the most famous men in Britain. Uh, interestingly, he had deconverted from Christianity well, uh, relatively recently. He had rejected Christianity. So he's got a wonderfully successful, like-minded man in many ways, but not a Christian. But at a similar time, she was also becoming more involved um, with the higher life movement, which again is where 
Keswick came out of, these people really yearning for something more in their Christian lives. And her mother was becoming more and more um, uh, religious. I think her, her dad had been the one with a really deep faith, and her mum was becoming more and more com- uh, committed as a Christian. So she was being pulled in another direction. Um, she went with her mum to the Broadlands Conference um, in Broadlands, the, the estate in southern England, and which was really where the kind of Keswick thing started. She went, went to a conference in uh, Brighton, which again, similar stuff, and in Oxford. All these conferences she went to and was being influenced by this teaching of wholehearted commitment to the Lord. Um, D.L. Moody, Moody and Sankey, the great evangelist, he came to um, England, well, UK at that time. And actually, I don't know if you know, but it was in the UK, that mission that launched his career back in the States. It was the first time that hundreds of thousands came to hear the gospel proclaimed. He was, you know, at least as big as Billy Graham um, in his day. And she and her sister uh, went and um, kind of counseled, um, basically, you know, talked through and helped people, draw people to faith, um, cabbies. He did a particular um, mission for cabbies, handsome cabs, you know, horse and cart, not black cabs in those days. And obviously they were working late at night, taking people and back and forth to the theatres. So they had a late night meeting. And she and her sister were counselling cabbies until 3 a.m., um, telling them about Jesus. So, what's she going to do? <laughs> She's got these two prospects. One, be famous, rich, fated, and see this God-given gift. Couldn't she use that for the gospel? And I'm not saying she couldn't. Could she have used that for the gospel? Or, she's got this drawing feeling that, well, hang on, what about my commitment to Jesus? What would that look like? Can I do both? What am I going to do? And this, by the way, is one of her sketches of a Venetian column, (laughs) just out of interest. Um, So just, again, take a couple of minutes, talking to your neighbour, and I don't think there is necessarily one answer. You know, I mean, there are people, aren't there, in the public eye who use their witness for great good. But just to think... Which of those options would you choose and why? Off you go. Just a couple of minutes to talk to your either to think to yourself or talk to a neighbour. So you can continue continue those kind of discussions later. It's an interesting challenge, isn't it? And like I said, I don't think I'm not would never argue that if you had a gift like that, it wouldn't be right to actually use it, as long as it's used for God's glory. But I think it's a challenge, because I think in our world, particularly now, perhaps even more so then, you know, people are encouraged, aren't they, to go for fame and fortune and wealth. And that is the pinnacle. Um, But she was really uh, conflicted, but eventually she was persuaded. And she said this, I shall probably go to see Mr. Ruskin for a few days, which I rather dread. I see as clear as daylight now. I cannot give myself to painting in the way he means and continue still to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I think he was very much of the mind that you have to... Art is a god, almost. And you have to give yourself wholeheartedly to art if you were ever going to, if she was going to be that greatest living artist, she was going to have to give herself wholeheartedly to her art. And she said, I can't do that. I've got to seek first his kingdom um, and his righteousness. Um, So it's a huge risk. I mean, here she was basically looking after her mum at home and kind of going around various conferences and being helpful. But what was her future going to look like? Um, And she wrote this, which I think is rather lovely. Um, She said... Uh, talking of a baby bird, he says, the face of the cliff goes sheer down. How can it venture into that great gulf with untried wings? But it gathers up its courage at last and dashes out. There is the giddy depth below. Its strength is failing already. One or two feeble flaps and it drops down, down. A moment more and all unseen, it knows not whence. Strong, warm wings are beneath and it's being borne up into a place of safety. The mother bird has swooped down and rescued it. 
And obviously, she's saying here, um, as an eagle stirs up her nest, flutters over her young, spreads aboard her wings, takes them and bears them on her wings, so the Lord alone did leave him. So it's a risk, but she knew that the Lord's arms were always going to be there beneath her uh, to help her, guide her and protect her. So, how is she going to prepare for whatever... Well, we know what happens next, and she heads off to Algeria. But actually, she didn't know what it meant, but she knew she was going to give herself wholehearted to Christian work. Um, she was a woman of deep prayer. I mean, she really did um, pray earnestly, and she also set up prayer meetings in central London, where she lived. It was a time when many more women were moving to London for work. Things were opening up, particularly shop work, um, but they were quite vulnerable. So she also helped in the foundation of the WCA, um, YWCA rather, for women who came to London. Um, and it was a pretty scary time to arrive. Um, so some of them did become prostitutes. These are Victorian prostitutes, by the way, in the picture, slightly dodgy. But she also worked with prostitutes, street women, who often got there kind of almost by default because they arrived in London. Perhaps the job wasn't there. They couldn't find accommodation. They were kind of exploited. Still happens today. So she helped um, rescue uh, prostitutes. Um, she also set up, I think it's a rather lovely idea, dining rooms for shop workers. There's nowhere for them to eat uh, because the men just went to the pub and it wasn't acceptable for women to go to a pub at lunchtime. So she set up special women's dining rooms and during those Bible, uh, the, in those dining rooms there were opportunities for Bible study and for prayer. Um, Ruskin was not happy. The painting question. He was not happy. He was actually quite jealous. He was a bit needy. Um, and he said, technically, you are losing yourself. Your paintings are in want of sunshine. There's real vulgarity there. Um, he kept on writing comments about, you left me. How could you? All these kind of comments, almost like a jealous lover. Um, quite mean, actually, and really trying to manipulate her into changing her mind and to rededicate rededicating herself to art. Um, but she was set. This is what she was going to do. She was still painting, but as a hobby. Um, her heart was in looking after um, vulnerable women in London. And she probably thought that was going to be it. This was going to be her life. Her father, after all, had dedicated his life to good works in London, in the UK. And as a woman, she could live at home, still support her mum, and carry on doing these amazing things and being really helpful uh, for the gospel. Uh, but she attended a mission meeting and she heard a plea for people to go to North Africa where the gospel was largely unheard. Um, she stood up in that meeting and volunteered uh, to go. She knew that it was not going to be straightforward. She had heart problems. Her health had never been that good um, and she was not going to be accepted on medical grounds by a mission agency. So she had heart problems. Um, and there was prejudice. I mean, she was a single woman. By this time, she was about 35. She's not a very young woman. She was about 35. Um, but a young woman going from a patriarchal society in the UK to North Africa, an even more patriarchal society. Also, um, Algeria. I mean, you think, oh, mission's easy in those days because it's got the British Empire. But actually, when you think Hudson Taylor, China, not part of the British Empire, actually caused problems because of the opium dealing, um, Algeria was French. And the French traditionally didn't really like the British at all. They were com competitors in terms of empire. So she was moving to a French colony. Um, and, but even the French, she spoke a smattering of schoolgirl French. She spoke no Arabic at all. Um, so it's not going to become easy. Um, and she decided she was going to stay, uh, to, to leave and not stay in London and do those good works, let alone become a great artist. And so she went and offered God her weakness. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? All those privileges, all those gifts, all those talents, and you think, well, how, why are you wasting all of that? You seem to be the most ill-equipped, kind of unlikely, unsuitable person to go to North Africa. But she said, here I am, take me. 
Um, so just, again, just for a couple of minutes with your neighbour, what stops you from serving Christ more wholeheartedly? Because I think it'd be very easy for us to say, come on, Lilius, this is insane. You know, you're doing quite good work here. Your health's not great. Your mum needs you. Um, and again, often some of those things are a really valid reason. But sometimes we do use them as a bit of an excuse. Um, and it's, sometimes it's not always easy to know which is which, is it? But what stops you, where you are now, serving God more hard, wholeheartedly than you do now? I found that very challenging when I <laughs> wrote that question and thought about it for myself. So just spend a couple of minutes again, um, either privately or with a neighbour, thinking about that question. So again, why don't you um, keep pondering that um, as you go through the day? Um, don't let that challenge leave you. I think there's always something that we can be asking ourselves, isn't it? Um, so off they went. Um, she went with um, two friends. There was real partnership, two other single ladies. And she said this when she arrived, said three of us stood there looking at our battlefield as they arrived in Algiers. None of us fit to pass a doctor for any mission society, not knowing a soul in the place, or a sentence of Arabic, or a clue for beginning work on untouched ground. We only knew we had to come. Truly, if God needed weakness, he had it. So, goodness me. I mean, nowadays, I'm sure none of these mission agencies would just kind of say, off you go, um, into uh, somewhere like that. That said, she had this partnership, these two close friends who went with her. Um, it's Amazing, the, from a very similar background, all three women, they'd never done housework before. So that, they quite enjoyed it to start with. It was quite a laugh, kind of playing house, but, you know, after that, it was a bit of a challenge. They were looking after themselves. They'd always had maids and staff. Um, they had to depend on God. They prayed and prayed and prayed. Very soon after they arrived, she said this. She said, we had such a lovely time of prayer. And when we got to the Arabic lesson, about which we had been especially praying. It was beautiful to have a set, such a sense of being cast upon God. So obviously, learning the language, they were going to have to, you know, God was going to have to help them with that. He's going to have to help them with everything. So they prayed and prayed and prayed. It's also passion. She knew when, why she was there. She was there to teach people about Jesus um, in whatever way she could. So from the start, they would reach out to anybody and everybody um, they were desperate to reach the Arabic quarter rather than the French. They hadn't come to speak to the French people, it was to the Arabs that they'd come. Um, but anybody. And they wrote little tracts in Arabic. We've got friends, you know, other people to write in Arabic and in French and would pass them out to anybody who was passing before they felt confident enough to actually speak in Arabic. Um, so they realised they had to move from the safety of the French quarter into the Arabic quarter. Um, which they did, which again, a lot of people thought they were mad, it wasn't nearly as safe, there were very few Westerners there, but they knew that that's where they had to be. But then there was a real challenge, that they needed their presence amongst the people they were reaching. But it was going to be really tough. How are they going to reach people? And the first people they reached were the small children who would just play in the streets, and they got alongside them and spoke to them. Um, and then some of the more literate men, they were able to pass tracts to and booklets to. But their heart was to reach the women who were behind closed doors. It was almost impossible to reach the women. But they kept staying. People thought they would leave pretty quickly because it was so tough. But they didn't. And initially, these street kids would kind of mob them and throw things at them and heckle. Um, but gradually, they won them over. They realized that they were here for the long term. Uh, they were going to persevere, and they eventually saw little cracks opening, and some of the street boys actually kind of protected them, rather than, some of them still heckled, but hey. But it, it got better, but they knew that they were there for the long term, however hard that was going to be. And little by little, progress was made. Um, five new co-workers arrived. Um, in 1906, a few years later. By 1920, I mean, it's a long time later, um, there were 30 full-time workers um, and 15 preaching stations across Algeria. 
Um, she made journeys inland. She went to different places. She wasn't satisfied just to stay in the urban areas. So she went into the Sahara and camped, set up little tents outside settlements and prayed over them and went in and prayed that she would meet exactly the right people and gave books that were desperate for any reading material. Um, so they were prepared to read Christian literature and made contact like that. Um, she had huge plans. She had incredible creativity. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit later, how God used all this creativity, but in very different ways. So she set up carpentry classes for the boys to have opportunities um, to talk to them and to teach them skills. Um, she organised conferences for mission workers in North Africa. She was obviously an incredibly capable administrator. Um, she also had a real passion uh, for the women. So the women and the girls, the girls basically sp stayed in their parents' home until they were 10 or 12, and then they got married. 10 or 12. And then they were transferred over to their husband's home behind closed doors. Um, and it was in, basically in a harem. And she had a real heart for these girls and these women, and they were very vulnerable. Some of them were divorced by their husbands as teenagers and were basically um, destitute. Um, so she taught girls weaving. So again, an opportunity to share the gospel, but also as a way of giving them a skill so they weren't entirely dependent on men who often exploited them and gave them opportunities um, to thrive in different ways as well. Um, and she prayed and prayed and prayed. Um, she said, um, when asking in the name of Jesus for this and that village and town and those dear, unreached and unreachable mountains and deserts, um, does, that prayer does set the sluice gate open to them. The powerlessness to go gives an intensity to the joy of prayer. So she prayed and prayed and prayed for all the opportunity she needed. And um, she was wonderfully, she loved her Bible and she loved the Lord Jesus. And interestingly, the two books of the Bible she loved most, which she said showed her with the fullest pictures of the one she loved. The Song of Songs, okay, and Leviticus. So isn't that interesting? When you're reading the Old Testament through the eyes of, I'm looking to see Jesus, she saw Jesus in Leviticus as the one who had fulfilled the law, the one who gave us freedom. So, quite something. She was an incredible pioneer. So she was, she had this God-given creativity, which obviously showed in her painting. And this is, it's very light in here, so you can't really see her pictures. Um, I'm no Ruskin. I don't know that she would definitely, in this, be the greatest artist of her generation, but she painted everything. Um, lots of pictures. If you want to know what um, North Africa was like at that period, loads of pictures. And um, she knew that it was really important to get stuff out to people. And so she decided to publish stuff. Um, and she knew that they were very visual people. And so she included her pictures in the tracts. And she drew and illustrated these tracks that went out to people. Um, and also, she, um, she had lots of different ways of reaching people. So the Sufi tradition was quite big in North Africa, a much more mystical um, tradition in Islam. And um, so she, would, she went to a native cafe, as she called it, a local cafe, and had readings of the Bible, but in a rhythmical, recitative kind of way that she felt would be more, more accessible um, to Arab speakers, accompanied by a drum, which would be more memorable and more accessible culturally uh, to them. Um, she set up a craft house again for, for teach girls embroidery. Um, she set up a Christian retreat for women so they could have somewhere to go as an outing. Normally, the only time they were allowed out of their houses was to visit um, local shrines, was the only time that they could go out in the fresh air. So she set up a retreat house where women could go safely, but also hear the gospel um, and hear the Bible explained. And she designed cards that had Bible passages um, on them. And she got uh, asked an Arab scribe to write it, she said, because only they can um, write it beautifully enough to convey the beauties of the words. Um, and she even 
did some, which was very radical at the time, did little postcards with a verse of the Old Testament and a verse of the Quran on them um, to sort of start conversations with um, Muslims in the area. And she was also an innovator in colour printing. Um, she said, these things need to be shown in colour. They're such a colour-loving people. We need to get colour into their hands, and that will make a bigger impact in what they're saying, uh, in what they're seeing. And um, parables. She, she helped people and taught them in parables. She knew the power of a story that Jesus had used, um, but also um, that she knew would get uh, that into the hands of the, the people. And so she used that creativity that Ruskin had praised for the good of the gospel, and actually in far wider ways than just painting. You know, she had an imagination, an artistic spirit that she used in so many different ways that she would not have been able to had she been a, a society painter in 19th century London. But, of course, it's never easy in mission, is it? It was tough. Um, there was persecution um, from the French, who didn't like her, um, from other missionaries who didn't necessarily like her, um, from some of the Muslim leaders who didn't like her. So there was quite a lot of um, persecution. Her health remained a problem. She had a heart problem, and that was persistently an issue. Her health was always poor. Um, and she did take regular trips back to the UK and Switzerland. Like Hudson Taylor went to the Switzerland for his health. She would go to Switzerland for her health. But when she was on furlough, when she came back to the UK, where did she always come to? Keswick. She was a regular attender at the convention. And in 1887, a fund was set up for missionaries on furlough to come and attend the convention for free. And I think it still is available for missionaries uh, to come and visit. Um, in 1901, there were 221 missionaries on furlough at the convention, funded by convention, and they only had one week in those days. So that's quite impressive, isn't it? 221 mission missionaries, and she was one of them. Um, she also spoke at the Swedish Keswick. I'm sure you know there's the Keswick Fellowship. There are Keswicks all over the world, and she spoke at the Swedish Keswick. And in 1893, she um, actually spoke here at the um, Keswick Convention. So she was um, used and supported and encouraged by Keswick, but also she used her experiences to encourage and build up others and call them into mission. The other um, hardship she found was the peril, if you like, that the converts faced. It was really hard. Um, they were um, persecuted by their families, they were cut off, um, and often fell into dreadful backsliding, which caused her real pain. Um, often these vulnerable women became Christians. Um, the pressure to return was so great. But actually, even when they returned, they were not um, welcome back into their community. So often they fell into sexual sin, prostitution, things like that. Absolutely heartbreaking. And the difficulty of breaking through the perda, the, um, you know, the barriers from women entering society. Soshin did it through the children, befriending the children, being invited into homes that way, but it was really hard to break in and speak to the women that she longed to speak to. And there were paltry results. Was there revival in Algeria? No. Some became Christians. Some had access to the Bible, but it was hard ground, and there were paltry results. So, was her potential fulfilled? I mean, I think it's one of these things, isn't it? We always think, oh, I want my children to fulfill their potential. I think it's a lovely picture of her in old age. I think she was a very, you know, doesn't Jesus just shine through that lovely, peaceful face? Um, she's not known as an artist. Very few people have heard of her. Her paintings aren't shown in the great galleries that they would have been had she um, been, you know, Ruskin's protégé. Um, but she was a woman of real prowess. 
She had so many gifts and she used each one of them for the gospel. She had administrative skills, which as a woman back in England in those days, she would have not been able to use. She had you know, a passion for evangelism and for publishing and for speaking and for explaining the gospel in simple ways. One of the greatest legacies, if anything, she did this wonderful little book on the I am sayings of Jesus for the Sufi. So the Sufi always were yearning to know God personally, which is different from perhaps the Sunni Muslims. And, you know, I am the light of the world. I am the life, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. And she did these wonderful illustrated little thoughts on the I am sayings, um, which are still around today, and wonderfully innovative in mission, the way she did all these different strategies um, in terms of how to reach people in different and new ways. So that creativity that God used is, was used in so many different ways. But Algeria is still very much a Muslim country. Um, it's still tough for mission work in North Africa. Um, out of her work, um, Arab World Mission was founded. I think Arab World Mission of Ministries. Um, that was founded. It still is going today, working with um, uh, people in North Africa, but also the diaspora around the world. Um, but there's so much more to do. And whereas with Hudson Taylor, perhaps you could say he sort of sparked that flame and... China is kind of now so much more of a Christian place. Now in Algeria, there's so much more to do. But there are people in glory now because of her witness and her ministry. If you think of, you know, the lost sheep, the one. You know, Jesus came for the one. And what he calls us to, isn't it, is faithfulness. Um, not fruitfulness. So she was fruitful in many ways. In her life, she was a wonderful, shiny example of Jesus. But in terms of, you know, letters back to the, to the supporters and the prayer partners, you know, how many converts have there been this year? Well, not many, not many. But there are those in glory because of Lilius Trotter and her ministry. And there are also there, those in mission now because of Lilius Trotter. Um, People have been challenged, and apparently, particularly, you know, within the Muslim world, people have heard of Lilia Strauss and thought, actually, gosh, there is still a great need there. Um, she wrote a little booklet, which she um, distributed at the uh, Keswick Convention as a real challenge to faith, and it was distributed, and a copy um, was bought by a friend and given to George Swan, who was Field Secretary of the Egypt General Mission, um, who then went on to write a lot about Sufi Islam and all this kind of thing. And he said he um, dated his call to that particular ministry of understanding Sufism and reaching out to them um, to that little pamphlet that he was given from the Keswick Convention, written by Lilius Trotter. So there were other works that came out of um, her life. And I think it's just a really personal challenge to us particularly, I think, now, when we are so much, I don't know if your grandchildren, your children, we are so much about fulfilling potential. You know, how we use our Sunday mornings. Oh, well, my child is a particularly good rugby player. We need to fulfill that potential. Oh, yeah, well, that means they can't go to church anymore. Or, you know, what does that look like? Fulfilling our potential doesn't necessarily look what the world says it looks like. And I think Lilius Trotter shows us that, that actually God's plans are better than our plans in fulfilling our potential, our children's potential, our grandchildren's potential. He wants us to fill our potential in far better ways than perhaps the world might say in terms of using our gifts um, and our talents and our privileges and our backgrounds. How can we use them for him? Lilius Trotter offered her weakness. And I think sometimes that's what we feel we're offering. But God will then take that and use it, I'm sure, in very surprising and wonderful ways. So, like yesterday, why don't you uh, spend a minute... Oh, sorry, no, I've got some pictures to show you. 
I will show you the pictures before we go on to the challenge. These are just some pictures with Bible verses that people have added. Again, the light's not great in here. Um, so some um, the pictures that Lilius Trotter painted. This one says, holiness, not safety, is the end of our calling, um, which is a great one, isn't it? Holiness, not greatness, is, um, and not safety, rather, is the end of our calling. It doesn't call us to a safe and comfortable life, but to holiness. And the next one. You can never tell to what untold glories any little humble path may lead if you only follow far enough. Again, <laughs> isn't that great? Um, and a rather lovely little picture of a little path there. And again, um, another rather beautiful one. which Bible verse. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Again, she lost her life for the gospel. But she knew that God saved it and for now and for eternity. And again, of thine, uh, of thine own have, uh, have we given thee, which was the verse we started with at the beginning. She was everything she had, all the gifts, all the talents, all the privileges were just a gift from God. And she handed it back to him and said, use them for your glory. So now we're back to the as yesterday. Just spend a moment just jotting down a challenge. So how have you been challenged by Lilius Trotter's priorities and her willingness to use her gifts for God's glory and not her own? And what will you change as a result? So um, either log it in your brain, or if you have a, a note-taking place, it's always a good idea isn't it, to write it down to remember, because you'll have so much else put into your brain for the rest of the day, so much wonderful teaching. Um, but just think one thing that I can change and I'm going to take on board as a result of what we've learned about Lilius Trotter. And then again, just for the last few minutes, it would be good to spend time in prayer. Um, I said, um, AWM still works in the Arab world. Um, it says that few even of the major towns in the Arab world um, have a Christian presence. Um, and they are working in cross-cultural work and church planting. So do pray for that. Um, and Arab world media which is obviously you know, a way of getting in, and also training um, leaders. Um, apparently, in 2015, 380,000 Muslims converted to Christianity um, in Algeria. Sounds huge. I think that's amazing. Um, but they are persecuted. So do pray. So do, first of all, pray for the use of your gifts, time, abilities in God's service. Pray for Christians in North Africa and those who seek to reach Arab Nations for Christ, the ongoing work of AWM and the Keswick Convention and the call to mission. So again, just um, for a few minutes, turn to your neighbour and spend a little bit of time praying. But do keep remembering uh, these things in your prayers. Um, just if you want to find out more about Lilius Trotter, I've been told that the, the um, biography, there is a biography called Passion for the Impossible. Um, sorry, Passion for the Impossible. I've been just told this out of print. I think it is available online as, a, as an e-book. There's also a film that's been made with Michelle Doherty, is that her name, who's in Downton? Dockery, thank you. Um, called um, So Many Beautiful Things, Many Beautiful Things, which you can see now for free on YouTube. You can watch that. Um, and uh, that's a good way of sort of finding out a little bit more about uh, Lilius Trotter. Um, and that is what, as she was dying, that, those were her final words. She said, I see so many beautiful things. And isn't that wonderful for an artist? Uh, she knew that actually in heaven it would be just pure beauty and pure joy. And uh, as she died, that's what she said. But there's a great, it's a good little film. It's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good as an idea about um, Lilius Trotter. And if you're not a reader, that's quite a good way of accessing a bit more about her. So as we finish, uh, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Lilius and her willingness to offer you not just her gifts, but her weakness. And thank you so much for the ways you used her, the way that she did fulfill her potential in you in ways that the world could never imagine. And Lord, I pray that you would point out to us how we can be more wholehearted for you in offering you everything that we have. I pray that you would help us to use the gifts, the talents, uh, the privileges, the position, the background that you have given us for your glory. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So tomorrow is the Keswick Lecture, but then on Thursday we're back with Barclay Buxton of Japan. Hope you see you then. <laughs>